Um, welcome, Dr. Brill. Welcome, Christopher. Nice seeing you, Perry. Nice seeing you, Dad. All right, we're going to give it a few minutes. We already have 16 people chiming in. It's got only about 200 left to come on, so. No. <laughs> Well, should we ask people where they're from, Perry? Yeah, so as people are joining us, uh, this is a very worldly podcast because we're talking about a, a topic that's not just focused on the U.S. There's frames made all over the world and some of the best ones made in Japan. So everybody tell us what city or province or state you're from. Put it in the chat. Or, or country. Or country, yeah. Island. Is it All right, so we got two people. Oh, that's funny. Hey, someone's, from, someone's from Kansas City. Randy yeah, Smith. Rand. Rand, is a, hey, Randy. Is, a, is a good friend and customer. Uh, okay, Jamaica, Aaron, love to have you on here, Aaron. You're, you need these frames and your high-end optical, so. <laughs> Where, what, who's Rand? Uh, I Smith is, a, uh, is on the other side of the river from you all. Oh, okay. Oh, I see. Yes, sure. Of course. All right. Brooklyn, hey, what's up, Gerard? Gerard runs um, a Lower manufacturing facility up in New York. Beautiful eyewear. Kevin, we got Kevin Count. He also makes eyewear on a hey, small Kevin. scale, custom. Um, so in just a, a few minutes, we are going to just go right into the tour. Chris is at his plant. Obviously, you can see. Do we call it a plant? What do you call it? I, I don't know. Shop, factory, workshop. Okay. Workshop is good. Workshop. How do you say workshop, workshop in Japanese? Sagyoba. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. I know the West Coast people, may, they probably start tuning in a little later. Mm-hmm. So um, anyways, I'm just gonna get a poll going here while we're, we're all, all of us are waiting. So um, we're gonna launch this and jump right into the tour. Christopher has a, his gimbal ready and he's gonna go take us around. So let's get a few uh, questions answered first. The most important thing is what, what's your favorite fruit from this short list? Uh, let's see, I don't, I think I had any, I had a pickle earlier. I don't think that's a fruit though. So. That, that would not count as a fruit. Uh, I did have a juicy watermelon this year. Then I let it, I always let it rot because I buy too big of a one. <laughs> All right. So um, if you're just joining us, make sure we know where you're from. Um, Frank Gomez, Konnichiwa. <laughs> Why are we learning? Can they answer all the questions, Perry, or just the fruit one? No, they can answer them all. The next question is, yeah. uh, we just want to know who's here. Are you um, in the industry? What's your role? I know there's people from other industries joining us. So uh, welcome to an exclusive look into the inner making of eyeglasses. Uh, just to let you know, Exotica does not make everything. <laughs> um, so if you're not selling Asian fitting eyewear, um, this is going to be a big component of the webinar. Um, as the world becomes more of a melting pot, you really need to be adding to your collections in your office for Asian, African fits, and one nose pad, just because it's kind of built up and doesn't mean it fits everybody. So we're going to be discussing a lot of that. Um, the moment you bring a Asian or African fitting line into your office, that's the moment those patients will start coming to you. So think about that. Well, Paris, since we have some non-industry people, maybe we should tell them a little bit about entrepreneur media. Yeah. What so uh, what are we doing here, Perry? Um, so this is about our 16th, 17th webinar. Um, we do a webinar every single week, uh, novel webinars, people that have never been uh, in the spotlight and Christopher is one of them. We met him at Vision Expo East, probably, I don't know, two years ago or so. Yep. And we carry both of his collections uh, in our office. So we are a customer. 
Um, and the moment we sat down, we knew this is the man. Like, he had temples that zigzag to get around like a more rounded head. And we're like, why isn't anyone doing that? <laughs> um, but Dr. Brill, tell us, you know, what, what topics do we cover in our podcast and webinars usually? Well, we call those people wizards, people that the industry may or may not know, but they are significant influence in what, what they do. And it may be uh, dry eye experts that, you know, we've interviewed the head of Healthy Eyes Advantage, a ABB. Uh, no one would talk to us from VSP or the AOA, but uh, we've had a lot. I mean, you just said 16 webinars, but we've had over 100 podcasts. Yeah. Sort of yeah. Podcast <laughs> aficionados. And then we have YouTube videos. Um, a lot of them are me tell, telling um, my colleagues really how to do stuff. You know, right. we try, we pride ourselves, and I always say we try to be five years ahead of everyone. And there may be something as so simple as how do you employ a scribe, and where do they stand, and what do they do in the exam room, so for you to be more efficient, so you work smarter, not harder. Or um, you know, we did one on dry eye diagnosis for non-dry eye doctors. Call it a three Fs of dry eye: a finger, a flashlight, and fluorescein. So for those of you that are tired of all the dry eye lectures which I love, uh, you know, take a look at some of those. They're all out and, there on the web. And Dr. Brill, we have a dry eye lecture on Tuesday the 8th uh, next week. And yes. uh, who's the guest? It's someone, so, we got big time guest. Yes, Dr. Peter Pham, P-H-A-M. And he is ophthalmologist in Houston. And he created a novel product using uh, a, a, a cleaner or a whole system based on okra. Okra, the, the vegetable. <laughs> slimy vegetable that's that's really good when it's fried so but he has a he has product that's uh called zocular and uh his cleaning method is called zest so he's a very intelligent doctor he uh the last dry eye webinar he had he, he he explained everything in terms of calculus so i'd have to now re refresh all my differential equations but he's going to go through his system how he developed and how it works uh, why we shouldn't use tea tree oil, which is pretty common. And I've used this system. So it's very interesting. And he and he's just a friendly and nicest guy you'd ever want to meet. So he's going to help uh, the doctors help their patients with a novel treatment modality. Cool. Well, uh, thanks a lot. And let's share some results here. Okay. Uh, water, watermelon's the winner. Uh, we got... Mostly opticians. Uh, next, we have optometrists and ophthalmology. And then... Uh, the results? Uh, yep. After that, um, most people are not selling Asian or African fit. So but this will give you a chance to learn about that. Uh, many of, of you are selling frames over 400, so good job. And um, have you listened to an entrepreneur webinar before? No. Well, congrats. And um, we have a lot more going on. Uh, other podcasts, and we're doing a blue light one for COPE credit uh, for optometrists. It's also great for opticians. We're going to be talking to Adam Berger. He's a retina specialist. Um, screens, uh, remote education, uh, it is a concern now. So we're going to be talking to him about that and kind of tell you, are those AR coatings really good? Are these lens materials with fancy names actually working? So we're going to get through all that. Yeah, so this will be the, that'll be the real deal. And it is COPE approved. So um, we'll make it. $15. It's, it's actually a real deal because there's a lot of hype about blue light. And now people are, uh, big companies decided, hey, we can make blue light glasses. And are they the real, are they real? Or so that you're going to get the truth about all this stuff from somebody who really knows. So uh, Scott wants to know when's the webinar with Dr. Pham on okra. Uh, it's on Tuesday and I'll put a link to it. Um, if, if you guys are not in our entrepreneur media group, uh, we run probably the most business savvy group out there. We focus on entrepreneurship, making money. So I put the link there. If you want to go ahead and click over there and join that group. Uh, but let's go ahead and get started. Uh, Christopher Esposito, welcome. And um, you want to give a short 30 second uh, introduction, who you are? Yes, yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate you all uh, joining us here. Greetings, uh, greetings from Sanjo, Japan. Uh, I've been here in Japan for 26 years. I came over as a research scientist. I used to design chemistries to uh, manufacture circuit boards, IC chips, liquid crystal displays, 
And um, after about uh, 12 or 13 years in the business, I ended up being director of a big group in an American uh, uh, research in an American company. My life turned to politics. I had in the meanwhile gotten kidnapped by my now wife and uh, settled down over here, left and started a business doing import and export. And so as part of that business, it was outdoors products, sunglasses. Then I got into cutting our own sunglass lenses, importing frames into Japan and really struggled with getting European made frames, European frames on the Asian face and, and high curve frames. And we tried everything. We would, you know, make special nose pads and this and that and other things. And about 10 years ago, or 12 years ago, I started having frames made in Fukui, which is where all of the eyewear in Japan is made, where 95% of the eyewear is made in Japan. And Fukui is all piecework. So one place does the temples, one place does the fronts, one place does the printing. It'll go through 10 shops before it's done. That worked really well when Japan was a high volume manufacturer, but once they became you know, sort of a lower volume, higher quality manufacturing, um, area that really hobbled the industry. And even now, there are only three factories in Japan, including ours, that can make an acetate frame from start to finish in house. And we're smallest by an order of magnitude. Um, and we also do some titanium work as well. So about 10 years ago, I started have 12 years ago, I started having frames made for us. And you learn when you get your first load of 2000 sunglasses at the end of the summer when they're supposed to be there in April, that you really don't want to be doing this, you know? Um, so instead of sinking money into stock, I put money into equipment. I used to be a woodworker. I am a woodworker. I have a woodworking shop here as well. Uh, I love making things. That, that is, you know, that is why I do what I do. And um, so put money into equipment. 10 years ago, we started making and selling frames. And maybe six, this was supposed to be our fifth or sixth Vision Expo East this year. Obviously, that did not happen. So um, anyway, so this is where we do it. There are only 10 of us. We're a, we're a small, small shop. Um, but everything is done. Pretty much everything is done here in-house. The only thing we don't do is coatings. I used to do research on plating chemistries and whatnot. I know enough about it that I know I don't want to do it. Um, <laughs> we use the best coating shops in Japan and uh, everything else is done here. So uh, we're gonna give you a tour around the whole, you know, the, the, uh, the shop here today, show you how we do things, and then, uh, you know, talk about design and, and fitting and, and our different lines and everything else after that. So um, can I share a screen for a second here, Perry? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, okay, and, very well. I'm gonna preface a few things. So Chris is okay. gonna give us a tour, um, and then we have a short ad from me, um, and then, Christopher is in business. So part of this is we do encourage you to support independent eyewear manufacturers, buy independent, break free from corporate America, mass produced brands. So um, do us a favor, support small business, um, give Christopher a chance to present his collections to you. And as you know, this way of buying frames is the future. So um, just want to make you aware of that. Hello, Peter. thank you very much. Um, and, and, and in fact, uh, oh, the whole thrust of Entrepreneur is really supporting independent uh, brands, independent manufacturers for independent eye care providers. That's opticians, op ophthalmologists, optometrists. So we are here for the in independents. Go ahead and share your screen, Christopher. All right. Uh, first, there's one other thing that um, I wanted to point out too. You know, we say made in Japan or made in Italy. Um, and you talk about the big brands and everything else. And it's an unfortunate way of the world right now that if something says made in Japan on it, I'd say about 50%, only 50% of those frames are actually made in Japan. And not saying there's anything wrong with being made in China or Vietnam or anywhere else, but you know, I get calls all the time. We made frames in China. You want to polish them up and put it and, and print them for us? You know, this is, this is if, you, if you look at the, uh, the actual manufacturing capacity here in Japan, or you talk to the raw material suppliers. You know, if you know how much titanium is being sold, you can tell how many frames are being made. And the number is about 50% of the number of frames that are claimed to be made in Japan. So- How is that legal? Uh, how is that legal? It's not legal, but it's done everywhere. I've been in shops in Europe, paint shops in Europe, boxes that say, you know, made in China on them with the brand name. And I've seen the, the parts going out of the shop 
print it with made in France. I mean, happens in France, happens in Italy, happens in Japan, happens all over the world. And it's, do they just buff it off, or what do they do? They just well, they they they'll finish it up and then just reprint it. I see. They just if okay. you go to if you go up into Belluna, you go up into the mountains in Italy too. You know, you go by these huge factories, and there are no cars in the parking lot. You know, and you say, how are these people making anything? You know, so um, we are, you know, the real deal. We, there, like I said, there are only 10 of us. All of our materials to the ability that we can are made here in Japan, if we, if they, if we can. Um, and uh, everything is done by us here. So it's, uh, they're, they're, it's becoming, you know, unfortunately, less and less of that. Uh, I so, see. And the Japanese like, style, the Japanese uh, style is, is what superior to the Italian Matsukeli style, isn't it? I, I believe so. I believe so. Yeah. I will, like, I will uh, be talking a little bit about the different types of acetate. Okay. Um, the okay. difference between an, a Japanese acetate and a, and a, and a, Euro, and a European acetate. Uh, because there are differences. It's the same material, but there's different less levels of plasticizers and not, whatnot. So I will, I will get into that a little bit as well. Okay, great. So um, we're going to get going on the tour here, I guess. I'm going to share uh, screen a little bit. This is kind of where it starts. And um, starts here in this little room that I'm in. I'm uh, the primary designer. I have two other people that design for me, or with me, that work for me. One was uh, Tada, is a, uh, he's an optician. And uh, he was also a designer for a very large uh, boutique woman's brand uh, called Kamado. And another, uh, the other woman that, a woman that works for me, Hiromi, she was the designer for one of the largest boutique women's brands in Japan, Bese Pese. And um, so, you know, we all kind of approach things a little bit differently. Uh, um, and, and you can tell, you know, we're all sort of, we all work within the same frameworks, but you can, you can tell the you know, differences between our styles a little bit. So this is kind of what, you know, design will start. Starts off in your head. And then, uh, you know, we'll, uh, let me move this over here. I'm sorry, I can't get to the, get to where I want to get to. But, you know, we look at, uh, you know, different, you know, frame shapes, how different PEDs work, we'll, we'll change around, sorry about that, uh, you know, if looking at different types of, um, you know, different eye shapes, you know, like a Western with, a, with a, a little bit of drop, a little bit of lift, you know, sort of more the Asian almond shape eyes, and, and, and you know, it just kind of gives you a feel. So it all kind of starts here, you know, with the you know, different plastic parts, metal parts, and whatnot. Um, after that, we uh, we go downstairs, and we can you can get me out of the screen here, uh, Perry. I'm going to switch over to our other. Uh, um, our, there we go. I'm going to switch over to the uh, gimbal. I'm going to walk down to the shop. Very good. All right. You have to. So um, you know, while, while he's doing that, I was going to say, <clears throat> I'm old enough to remember that when something said made in Japan, it meant it was bad. You know, like people would joke, that's made in Japan. But that's not true anymore. You know, we're, um, when we, was, we, well, we say made in Japan, that means like, wow, that's good. So. Yeah, I remember too, it was, it was rubber alligators and, and you know, cheap plastic uh, boom boxes, you know? Yeah. Um, so. So here's just some, some, some acetate we've got here. Um, we source acetate from both, uh, you know, from Japan and from Europe. Japanese acetates have, Jap Japan is very humid. I'm standing here, we're just catching the tail end of a, um, of a typhoon and it's like 90% humidity here. And so acetate picks up a lot of water. And Tell us what acetate really is. What is it made of or how it's made? <laughs> Acetate is pulp and cotton, and they then use acetic acid, and they will they will they will react it with acetic acid, and that creates your screwdriver handle. Okay, and then in order to soften it, they will put in a plasticizer. Now plasticizer is in there from anywhere between 23 and 26 percent. The plasticize in the Europeans use a very high level of plasticizer. It makes the frame softer. It's easier to adjust, but it picks up more water and it is not as stable. 
the Japanese acetates, since it's so humid here, you know, they would make their acetates with a very much a much lower level of plasticizer. And that just gives you a more stable material. Um, it, you'll find that you need a little more heat to adjust it. Can you pull one of those so sheets this, out this there, sheet looks like. Chris? Oh, yeah, good. okay. So how long is that? Is it about five feet? Uh, this here, well, this here has been cut in half for okay. our storage purposes. The European acetates come in at about uh, five feet long. Uh, the Japanese come in at about two and a half feet long. So, it, 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 you know, every acetate, some of them come in at uh, two feet by four feet. Uh, it depends upon the material. But, okay. you know, the nice part about acetate versus a um, injection molded material is you get all of these brilliant colors that, you know, um, I don't know if you're going to be able to see this, but you get all of these brilliant colors that you just cannot get, you know, through injection molding and then painting. And, and when you polish acetate, it's very much like wood. You can kind of burnish it. You get this really deep sheen and shine that you just cannot, um, you cannot get with, uh, you know, with, uh, with a, an injection molded material. Right. And Is you there get a, these really beautiful, interesting. Mm -hmm. Is there a shelf life? Is there a shelf life to acetate? Like it can only be there for you know a year or? Uh, not I, well. It would not be. Year. I mean, as frames get older, they will dry out. They lose their plasticizer a little bit of a time. If you if you work on a vintage frame from the '60s, you will find that it is you know it is significantly um, harder. You can break it. Whereas you know acetate, um, freshly made acetate is much more flexible. Now, you actually worry the other way. The European acetates are, have so much plasticizer that they move around all over the place. And we go through special drying steps and, and stabilization steps to remove internal stress. I don't think anybody else really does that. Um, and just makes it a little more stable for when, you all, uh, when you're all producing, uh, when you're all, you know, uh, when your customers are using frames. So, um, so that's-, that's beautiful. Yeah, this, yeah. you know, you really, really beautiful materials to work with. So the frames, so Chris, the frames that look like they're plastic, and we sometimes call them plastic. I mean, a lot of, a lot of uh, opticians still ask that first question, which I really hate. Uh, do you want a plastic or a metal frame? Which right. generally eliminates half the frames in a dispensary, and we, we show about 2,000 frames. So, um, and I think, why did you say that? So, they're not really plastic, are they? Well, if it is, it, it's, 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 it's a type of plastic. It is not, it is a bio-based plastic, not a, not an, you know, an oil-based okay. plastic. Not an oil-based, okay. Yeah, and it's a natural, it's a natural material. You know, you cannot, I mean, there are great things about, you know, sports sunglasses and, and the TR90 type of frames. Right. Um, but you can't adjust them properly. Yeah. You know, they are, you, you can't, uh, you know, you, they don't fit the customer as well. And I think right. that's one of the reasons why acetate, you know, originally it was cellulose nitrate. Oh, and that is combusted, what, yeah. Oh, yeah, I mean, I know people actually here, old school craftsmen that have burns over half their bodies because when that stuff lights on fire, you can't put it out. That will burn underwater because it creates its own oxygen as it burns. And you throw water on that and it'll flare back up at you. And I, I know people that have, that have, you know, factories that have burned down from it. I know people that have been injured by it. Uh, and we don't use it. It's beautiful when you can, but... You know, that's what the old um, film cameras and whatnot used to be made of. So. Right. To everybody that um, has questions, there is a Q&A section at the bottom of Zoom. And we encourage you right now to start typing your questions. Um, after the tour, we're going to answer everything. Be as detailed as you want. We'll answer it. Uh, Brian Finley wants to know, uh, is Takiron the best Japanese acetate? All right. So this is... Um, the first step where the front, the machine's running here. It's going to be a little loud. It'll be done in a second. Um, so uh, right now, this is, uh, this is our uh, CNC. And the first step is you will take that acetate that you see and we'll cut it out into blanks. And those blanks then go into the CNC. And the first thing we do is we cut out the eye shape. We put in the groove. I don't know how well you can see that. Put in the groove. We'll do thicknessing on them. We put in the areas. I'm not sure how well you can see that, but the areas where you, there you go. Um, 
the areas where you put the hinges in. We do, you know, all sorts of different work on that. That then goes in and gets, it goes into a jig where it's held from the eyepiece and it will then be cut out into the shape of a frame. So we're gonna go over here. So the CNC lathe is kind of pantographing it or, um, you know. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you there. The CNC lathe is kind of pantographing it or really doing a lot of the work that used to be manual. Yeah, this is, you know, we will, uh, we, we use the CNC to cut the, the, uh, the, um, the plastic here. Now, you can do it by hand. Nobody cuts by hand anymore. It's either a pantograph or a CNC. And honestly, a CNC is harder to run, but gives you superior, um, superior, uh, um, I'm sorry, uh, accuracy. So you can see here we're routing out, you know, different parts of the back of a frame where the hinges go. Use all sorts of different tools. The tooling on this kind of machine is, uh, is very expensive. And the type of tools, the way they cut, the way that the, 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 uh, the, the angles, the way the chip is disposed of, um, all has a huge effect upon how clean your cutting is. How clean your cutting is determines how much work you have to do later on. So here we're putting in the V-groove. And then what do you do with the waste? And I'm sorry, I cannot hear what anybody is saying. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now here we are, this is going on, this is the, the back side. This is now we've switched over to the front. Let's give a... And, and depending upon the frame, you know, this, this, you know, we, we switch things up. We put a lot of different chamfers in this, this happens to be a very simple frame. This will become a, uh, this will become a combination frame. So we're going to actually process this and then separate it later. And so that is how you cut your front. Very cool. So that was about what, 60 seconds? So. So that is how you cut your fronts. Awesome. All right, so now the temples, we either cut using a CNC that you see there or we use a pantograph which is here. You have templates that fit here. Your part gets clamped in here. And then you cut, you manually cut by hand. This is a thicknesser. And we do three-dimensional templates, which is something that European and Chinese frame makers don't do. They're actually much more comfortable. Um, what what so does that mean? Is, um, what does three-dimensional temple mean? So you would take, in, with, a, with a typical temple, you know, the, the thickness is consistent from the temple to the, the, the front where the hinge is to the tip. With a three-dimensional temple, we actually sculpt the temple. Here's the shape. I don't know how well you can see this, but it's, you know, three millimeters here by, the, by where my fingers are. It's only two millimeters over the ear. And then it's four or five millimeters here at the tip. That gives you a little extra weight at the back. It's a little more sculpted, and it gives you a little bit of ballast. And so um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a different way of making temples. You actually have to use dies that look like this. I see. That are, that are actually cut three-dimensionally um, to the shapes in, in both the, 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 the X, Y, and Z directions. And those go in, and, and, you, and you insert your cores using these machines here. So this is what a core looks like. You know, you either have, for a riveted frame, it would have no hinge on there. A standard Monel core 
which is a stiff skin. This is what 99.9% .9 of the industry uses. It's very stiff. We are the only ones that do this. This is a beta titanium core. And the reason you do this is because wow. it's super flexible. Nice. And so you can, this is actually, you know, a typical, a typical piece of plastic, a typical temple, you know, this is kind of how much it bends, right? With a beta titanium core and a super thin. And it goes right back to its memory. Wow, nice. That wears like a pair of slippers. Nice. Nice. So, so this is how you do your core insertions. And then also you do, we do um, hand cut temple tips. And you basically use the same machine. You do not insert a core. You insert a, you insert a, a, a rod and then pull it out. And that leaves behind the hole in the acetate that your um, that your uh, that your 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 wire your your metal temple will go in. So take this over. Here we have the core insertion machine. You heat it up I mean, first. I, Is it heated? Uh, it's heated. Yes. So your your this is a eight, uh, a high frequency heater over here, and here you have. A heat a die, okay, that I just showed you. In here, you put your core underneath here. This is about 350 degrees Celsius. Wow. And, and the plastic is inserted into the part, and then the core is inserted into the plastic, which is held inside of that die. Wow. And that is how you do core insertions. Now this is difficult anyway. This is the hardest part of the entire process. It's difficult anyway. And when you start trying to do that with that beta titanium 0.9 millimeter, 0.8 millimeter beta titanium wire, it is a nightmare. This is why nobody does it. The beta titanium wire itself costs as much as a, me a metal temple. Then you wrap it in plastic. It's a uh, it's an extremely difficult process. I think we're the only ones that uh, we're uh, one or two companies in Japan that will do it, uh, in the world that will do it. So, so these are how temples are produced. Now we're going to come over here, and we're bending some frames, bending some fronts. These are what your bending guys look like, and if you notice. We have all sorts of different bridges, different thicknesses, different cur base curves. And so we now, is this in the sale? Is this in the sale line or the urban line? Uh, we, we, we use both. We use them for both. So for okay. the frame that we sculpt out behind the eyes to lighten the front, you see how this is three dimensional. Yeah. Wow. And then for frames that we don't sculpt out, you see this is flatter. So this would be a base four curve. This is a base 5.5 or more like a pair of sunglasses. And so we, you know, we change, you know, the different, um, different dies for the way we want the bridges to look. You've got a very square and a slight change in the bridge makes a huge change in the, in the, the frame. So you've got a square, very sharp bridge here. You've got a more rounded bridge here. And so, you know, we have all sorts of tooling that goes along with this. So this gets heated and put into the press and is pressed and cooled. And that sets the shape. We then go through heat treatment afterwards that further reduce the internal stress. But it's, it's a very, it's, it's a thermoform material. So as you all know, and then later on you can you know, reshape it, rebend it. Sorry for all the noise here, guys. But um, and there are so many different pieces of equipment. We make a, we make all of our own, a lot of our own equipment. Um, I'm going to skip a little bit. We'll get into how we put the hinges on and everything else in a minute. Um, I'm going to skip a little bit uh, forward because I'm here. But this is uh, after being bent and nose pads applied. They go through the frames. Go through the barrels. The barrels are how you do your 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 polishing. So do you have teak wood chips in there? What kind of chips do you have? I'm sorry. What kind of chips? Teak wood chips or what? Yeah, these are. Uh, we use all sorts of chips. This is a uh, this is a very large. This is your first step. Very rough 
take off big scratches, knock off the edges. This is an old school bamboo, um, and we use pumice. Okay. And this will roll around for anywhere from six to 20 hours in, in, inside of a barrel using these chips. Now, if you want to, this will take off all the edges and give you a really round old school finish. These here are plastic chips. Again, this is the rough. We use a, uh, a different, uh, a different uh, type of pumice. And this, will, this takes off the surface, but doesn't hit the edges as hard, so we can keep a real sharp edge. And then as you go through and use finer and finer chips, this is uh, bamboo and maple, I believe it is. Um, and, uh, you know, use finer. They have, they're like a pencil-like, so they get into corners. And then your final barrel will be very, very fine chips. And this, this is kind of an art form. I mean, you put your hand in it and you, and, and you feel the, uh, you feel the um, material. You, you, you feel how, how wet it is. And yeah, so, for, so for people that, and whatnot, so for the people that don't know, these are big tumblers. And they have what uh, Chris is saying is they have a varying type of coarseness to it to take the frame right. from a coarser uh, finish to a finer finish. And this is time consuming. So, and they're what, you have four different barrels or five? Well, we run four different barrels um, okay. for the most part. Um, and they just I, tumble I, I, around. I they just tumble. So. It, Exactly. So this is, you know, we've got uh, right here, we have eight barrels. We can fit about 100 to 150 frames in a barrel. They'll, they'll go for anywhere, probably an average of 20, 20 hours. Um, how, fast, each, how fast is it spinning? Pull them out. I'm sorry? How fast do those barrels spin? Uh, they spin about, hang on a second. Pretty slow. Cool. It's, it's barrels of fun. Barrels of fun, right? Barrels of fun. So, I mean, these are all homemade, you know. Um, that's the thing here in Japan, you don't have a huge industry, so they don't have like, you know, you don't just go to the store and pick one of these up. So, so this is what the inside of a barrel looks like. And it just, you know, every, every, after every grit, you take them out, you wash them off. And then you go to the next and we'll do polishing steps in between um, as necessary. And we're gonna skip to the kind of the final set stage here. This is this, you know, we've got uh, some people here polishing. This is uh, probably the most time consuming part. We use several different types of wheels. All of these wheels are specially made for us. I live in a, the, this is the city I live in is the polishing capital of the world. Wow. And I tell them what type of material I want, how many layers, how many stitches, whether it's sized or not sized. Um, and then they will make them to our specifications. The thicker and the heavier the material is, like here, it pr will produce a deeper scratch. The finer and stiffer, like something like this, will produce a very fine scratch. And then a very soft material here, which we actually boil to remove sizing from, you know, we'll, we'll put that sort of beautiful final finish on it. And you'll use a number of different types of um, polishing materials. We use five different types typically, actually six. We also do an old school um, pumice, which is basically you make mud and splash it on the wheel. It is wonderful in the summertime, it's cool. It's like a mud bath and in the winter when you've got to break the ice layer off the top of it, it sucks. Um, but you know, this is a, uh, this will polish both plastic and metal. So you take down the head of your pins at the same time. And then as you go through, this actually is used for platinum and fine jewelry. And it's, it gives you this beautiful, beautiful sheen at the end. So, so for those, for those, so those viewing, and especially the consumers, uh, you can see that even though you see a beautiful frame, it went through a lot of hand steps from skilled craftspeople who are individually working on every single frame. So people are like, how could that be so expensive? And 
I mean, I can just get a frame for seven bucks anywhere, you know, and there are some big manufacturers, I'm not gonna help support them, that, in, that just mold these frames, right? They injection mold them, they put, and, um, and so that's not comparable at all to something that's gone through all these hand, hand steps. So Chris, maybe you can comment on that a little bit. What makes a difference yeah, between a $6 frame to the consumer, which is probably 50 cents of, of material and workmanship in it? Sure. Well, you know, those, I mean, they crank them out. You know, they, they don't most for the most part, they won't even polish by hand. You no. go together. I've seen shops in China where they'll polish. They'll put five or six frames in their hands, run it underneath one wheel for like a 30 seconds. And that's it. And, and you can tell the difference. You can tell there's a deep, deep shine. And when you properly polish a frame, it actually hardens the surface. It becomes more scratch resistant. Um, as because you're burnishing that and you're hardening and, and you actually end up hardening the surface at the same time. So there's, you know, the, the amount of time that is spent at this we, at these wheels is, and, and you can shape on the wheel as well. So, you know, for difficult shapes, we'll do different types of chamfers. And it's a part of the, it's a part of the, uh, uh, it's, it's truly a, a skill um, and, and it's a dying skill. So, we, you know, we, all of our people know how to polish. I, I, have a, I have a belief that your people should be able to do everything in the shop. And it makes your life more interesting. You know, everybody doesn't just sit in front of a wheel for the rest of their life. You know, one day they'll be doing this and they follow their frames, they follow the parts through the shop. And, um, you know, if you make a mistake now, you fix it later. And so it teaches everybody to be a little bit more careful. And it makes your work a lot more interesting. So, um, you know, we have polishers, we have, this is a sandblasting machine to do matting. Um, we also do some, you know, here's a 35 ton press that we do metal forming on. These, we're not running it today, but this is um, titanium welding and soldering. Titanium is very different from Monel. You know, with, we do a brazing process, which is probably the strongest process, but it's also the most labor intensive. You see all of these little pieces of glitter in here. That's 0.1 millimeter thick or less. Um, 0.8 millimeter, little tiny pieces of uh, super high temp temperature soft. And by hand, using this little thing, this little tool here, you actually, I'm not sure if we're gonna be able to see this, but you actually spot weld that to the back of a hinge. And then you would put the, put the hinge here into the machine, you purge I, um, argon gas and run about a thousand amps through it. Very high temperature, it reaches up over a thousand degrees Celsius. And you get, and you weld your, you know, you will weld your hinges here. Wow. Onto the metal, you know, and you have different jigs for different welds. So, you know, here you see this is more for a regular temple. This would be for butt welding. Uh, for every weld, you will have a completely different jig set. And um, we don't do full metal frames yet. We just do combination pieces, but um, it will get there eventually. So all sorts of, uh, so we have all sorts of different, you know, all these machines here. For example, here, this is how we cut our fronts, where our fronts meet the temples. We do it very differently than other shops. So I set this place up to do small lots. So setup is easy, quick, very accurate. And the other side of it is, you know, the efficiency per, per piece is probably a little less. So we, we re-put the frame in the original die that it's cut in. And then we run it underneath these cutters to give you a very accurate, you know, we, we, we change the angles on the cut, the cutters to give you a very ang accurate cut in the front. Then the temples are put into this machine. We use optical stages. So we've got a theta, a beta, a Y, and then you, or an X actually, and then you, your Y moves automatically here. Your temples go in, you set the amount of angle you want on the machine, and then you cut the end of the temple tips. And, um, and then everything is, you know, filed afterwards. So all these machines, you know, we, um, we build ourselves. Here we have a uh, bending machine. 
And this produces very accurate bends. And so they're just hundreds of little tiny pieces of equipment that do, you know, there are hundreds of steps that go into manufacturing a frame. Um, and at the end, it seems like such a simple object, but it is actually very, very complex. So uh, that's sort of the downstairs here. I'm gonna go upstairs for a minute and show you a couple of other, uh, you know, where we do some other handwork. Uh, Perry, did you wanna take a, do a quick uh, advertisement here while I get up there? Yeah, sounds good, thank you. All right, see you guys in a minute. Are you doing an ad here, Perry? Uh, yep, I'm getting to it right now, so. Okay, very good. Just a moment. All right. So you guys, some, some pretty friends. Maybe I'll go into a couple of questions here. Um, okay. So Erwin says, uh, how long does the process of acetate production take from start to the sheets? Uh, take from start to the sheets, and are mm -hmm. they limited? I'm sorry, to the, to the sheets? Yeah, I'm not sure what that means. Production of uh, the process of acetate production take from, from start to the sheets. I guess he's thinking about how long does it take to make a sheet of acetate? Sheet of acetate. Um, that's a good question. You know, I've been in through um, manufacturing facilities. They don't show you a lot sometimes. Um, you know, the, there's a, the drying step is the longest step. You know, they'll typically hold it for, um, for you know, a few weeks to a few right. months before, uh, before releasing it. The actual production itself, you know, the, the, anything, like anything with production, your setup time it depends upon how many you make. You know, the amount of time it takes to set up a machine um, versus the amount of time for each sheet is probably not that high, but you've got to pull out all of your different, you know, pigments, you've got to pull right. out all of your materials. They typically will buy pellets. You know, the, the acetate manufacturers, Matsukeli and Takidon and all these acetate manufacturers will buy pellets. They buy these huge bags of pellets. And so the plastic itself is made by other companies. Um, and then, you know, they will then combine that, heat that, put, you know, and, and, and Matsukeli does all sorts of crazy stuff to their materials too. But, um, and then, you know, run that through rollers. The actual time per sheet is probably not so high, but when you figure out, you know, pulling out the materials and mixing up the pigments and, the, and everything else, it, it, uh, you know, it, is, it is an expensive piece of plastic. It's not like buying, out, it's not like buying acrylic. I used to work for the largest acrylic maker in the world. Um, and, you know, acrylics are, you know, it's, 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 we used to sell our chemistry in tanker cars. Um, you know, your acetate will be 10 times more expensive than something like that. All right, here you go. We're going to do a short ad. Um, I'm going to do the imp uh, quick version here because else I'm going to get feedback. Um, Dr. Brill, can you see my Word doc? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, so as you know, we, we have partners with Entrepreneur. We partner with pretty much new tech startups. That's who we believe in. We believe in software and efficiencies. Um, so number one, if you're taking some type of financing, giving financing tools to patients, uh, there's a new player to the game. They're called Sunbit. They actually have payment plans. It's a soft, they do a soft credit pool, not a hard pool. So your patients will never have their credit dinged. And the benefit of Sunbit is they accept even low credit scores. Uh, about 90% of people are, are approved. So you're never gonna look stupid when you present uh, Sunbit. They have such a cool software. It's all tablet based. They'll actually ship you a tablet and you simply scan the patient's driver's license or state ID actually. 
and it will pull all the information from their card and you get an instant credit decision within 30 seconds. Um, this has increased our cash flow so much in just this month in the three days. Uh, they have a really cool feature. It's a pre-qualification feature. Uh, what we do at uh, Brittle Eye Center, my dad's practice, is we send out a mass email and text messages to all of our patients coming in uh, that week, send them a pre-qualification link, um, and they come in and we know that they're going to be a dedicated spender because they got qualified for money. Um, giving payments is not just for poor people. It's for everybody. Uh, we even know wealthy people love saving and love using payments. We use it on shoes, furniture. Payments everything. over time. Payments over time. 90 days, six, 90 days, six months, and 12 months payment plan. So text this number, get a live demo, and you'll thank me later. Uh, lots of other features. This is not like that other person out in the industry uh, who offers financing. This is way different. So um, the next thing is all of our patients are asking to buy glasses online. How do I know? Because they're doing it and they're doing it behind our backs and they're going online, buying Zenny, buying other crap when they should be buying our stuff. Uh, I'm actually selling Christopher's frames on my website, uh, Sayo and Ethnicity. You can go to, um, if you want to go to my website, I'll type it here. You can see we're the real deal shop.berlite.com. We're actually selling about, I don't know, 15 brands and um, we're adding more every week. So you can even use your vision plans online, ship the frames to the patient. It's a whole suite of software built for optometrists and independent opticians. So do yourself a favor, buy into the online model and um, you'll be very happy you did that. So. And it's just another way, it's not to supplant what you're doing in the office. It's just another way to, uh, another channel that patients often want, they want to preview frames or maybe they don't have time. You know, they tell you, oh, I don't have time today. Uh, so essentially when the patient leaves the office, they get a nice little friendly email and say, hey, shop online and you got, it's not just online, but it's it's in office. So it's, it's both. Yeah, um, sometimes people, if they go to your website, um, you know, bobseyecare.com and that you're not displaying your individual SKUs you sell, they're going to assume, you know, it's a mystery of what you sell. So it's really important. Even if you don't make one single sale in a year, at least you've captured people saying we sell beautiful Japanese eyewear. So, um, but we'll get back to the webinar here and um, we're upstairs now. So what's going on? We're upstairs. All right. Well, this is where sort of more the, the, the handwork goes. Um, this step here, where we apply the nose pieces. This is actually done before the polisher. Um, I just didn't do it in order because I ended up running up and down stairs. We use preformed nose pads and of all different sizes, of all different heights, um, all different shapes. And we use these, you know, I used to, when I first started making frames, the, you know, hand sculpted, um, nose pads out of the same material. It, as a craftsman, it's beautiful. The thing is, you know, we're creating a functional piece of art. And when you have a, you know, big black nose pad, especially on an Asian nose pad where, you know, they're much larger like this, and you put that on the frame, you put it on, it destroys the line of the frame. And if, and if you notice, I, when, I, when I look at somebody wearing a new frame, I, I always try to look at the first place my eye goes. And if you've got these big black nose pads or brown or whatever, the first place your, your, your eyes go is right in the middle of their face. And you, know, you end up looking at them crossing. So we use these clear pads. And this also you know, allows us to, you know, very, um, to adjust the fit and the, the height. And actually over here, all of my customers will cut off, remove and replace pads, you know, to their, uh, to, to fit their, um, to fit the end user. Um, that's very common over here. So, you know, we just, you know, basically it's a solvent, it's a solvent uh, adhesion process. I mean, we have a little jig here and you, you, you put them on and press them on and it takes about, you know, it takes a little while to dry. Um, and then they go into the, the polisher. So, you know, this is, uh, this is, you know, we do that, we do this a little bit differently than, um, you know, a lot of the European frames, they come with, a, they, they, if they're sculpted out of the same material, they're not as high. Um, and I find that a higher fad pad fits me better. Just gives you a little bit more surface area. 
and the frame doesn't slide around as much. So um, sure, sure. this would this would be sure. done before polishing. So you're talking about what we might call uh, universal fit, Asian fits, sure. um, flat, essentially for people with flat bridges. And I hate seeing somebody wearing the wrong, they've got a Ray-Ban on and it's, a, it's digging into the nose. They're Korean, they have no bridge. And, and they're overjoyed when we say, hey, we have, we have frames that actually fit you. I mean, they're designed for your face, they fit you. And as Chris was saying, a lot of times these frames fit everyone better. They feel more comfortable, the weight's distributed better. Absolutely, well, you know, another part about frame design too, it's, and, and you're right, it is the bridge fit. It's also the balance of the frame. I mean, if you look at this, um, this frame here, and this, is, this has got a Western fit nose pad on it, but you know, the, it, we use a little bit of a heavier of a temple tip, and that just gives a little bit of ballast at the back. Yeah. And pretty without a you know high nose bridge, um, to have a little more weight in the back just brings a little bit more weight off the front. And a lot of you know a lot of the Asian population have very high prescriptions, and that and so you know yeah. it's it's worse. Um, so at any rate, so we put on the nose pads over here, and then you know there's all sorts of handwork, you know filing, scraping, um, before frames go together, after frames go together, and you know sort of they're all numerous numerous um steps you know over here we're doing some pinning so we've got these you know riveting is is a very time consuming process you know, we've got these little buckets of tiny little rivets which they make on a racing machine and you gotta you know you've gotta you've gotta chamfer out and then insert them one one by one and some of our frames i've got frames with 14 rivets in them everybody hates me um, so, so you press them in and then this over here is a homemade riveting machine. The green machine on the right is a commercially made machine. I didn't like it. Um, this is actually an air hammer. And we built this ourselves as well. This is an air hammer and a press. And it just allows very, very fine control. Bring it down, position it. And then, and then head the pump. This is really like Santa's workshop, so, isn't it? It's Santa's workshop. Yeah. It's like this. I don't know if, how well you can see that. Yeah. That is awesome. So, yeah. Wow. I built this because I wanted to do a vertical through rivet through the top of a frame. And there is no equipment to do that. And so we re rebuilt the machine. We can, we can rivet in any direction with this. You can take it out and rivet by hand. We have a little tiny drill. I don't know if you can see it over here. We built this too. This drill will actually drill on the inside of a lens. Rim. It's kind of hard to get my gimbal in here, but this will drill on the inside of a lens rim. Um, so there's just a lot of, you know, a lot of very specific equipment. Um, so there's riveting, you know, these are, these here, this machine here, and this machine over here is heat sink. And basically you will clamp your, your um, sunken hinges inside this machine here, run some electricity through it, heat it up. We have all sorts of multi-directional stages for, you know, X, Y, Z, theta, height. And um, yeah, there's a little clamp there that you know, you clamp, these are, these are actually, again, hand-built machines. These are pick and place machines from the IC industry where you put computer chips onto boards. Okay. Uh, we've got a press. You, with these old hand presses, you can get a ton of, uh, uh, literally a ton of pressure out of these old hand presses, but they're extremely accurate. And then you would take, we're just pulling out a little sample here. You would take your um, hinge, which has a little anchor in the bottom, clamp it up inside and then heat press into the frame, it sinks the hinge, and that's how most hinges are made. This is so much faster and easier than riveting here, which you can see every pin has to be put in by hand. The little metal parts are put in, everything's pressed together, and then they're riveted one at a time. Um, hey, Chris. So, you know, we have printing. Yes. One of our, uh, one of our uh, participants or listeners is uh, Kevin Count. 
who hand makes frames in Chicago. Hi, Kevin. And, and I think he's drooling right now. So <laughs> wipe up your drool, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> he's going to come over to, J J uh, to Japan and ask you to make a bunch of these instruments for him. Just season, Kevin. Yeah, we make, you know, you know I, I, I believe very strongly that, you know, we, there are two types of equipment. There's universal equipment and there's, you know, process specific equipment. And for the most part, you know, like the machine, the CNC you saw downstairs is universal equipment. You, you buy that piece of equipment from program, you can make a different thing. And, you know, the thing with a piece of equipment like that is anybody who buys that piece of equipment can make the same thing. With a, you know, a more specific piece of equipment like that core insertion equipment, you know, it, it only does one task, but anybody that buys that piece of equipment can make the same product. I believe that you create your tools to create what you want to create. You don't change what you want to create to fit your tool. And so that's why, I mean, you look at some of these weird pieces of equipment, everything, you know, that we build, we built to do something a little bit differently because, you know, that's the vision that, you know, I or my people had in how we wanted to be, you know, creating, creating frames. So, um, you know, here we have um, hot stamp where you actually emboss printing. These are all stamps with different model names and whatnot. I don't know if you can see these here. Yes. And those go in here. There's a hot stamp. It's like stamping your pencils. You know, you have ink and you put your template underneath and you heat it up and you press it in there. Um, we also do screen printing and laser printing. I don't like a lot of printing in my frames. We laser print. We, we, we stamp our name and then we laser print. This is a laser printer here. Um, we laser print the, uh, the model information and whatnot. Um, and then, you know, polishing, different types of polishing equipment, grinding equipment. Um, this is to bend your temple tips. If we only have, you know, 20 or 30 to do, you do them by hand. But if we've got more than that, you know, which is typical, um, you know, we use this. You put your, you take your frame, you heat the temple tips. The frame fits in here like this and this head comes down and bends, gives you an even bend um, on, your, uh, on your temple tips. Got some lens cutting equipment. We do not do RX here. We only do Plano. Um, cut test lenses and sunglass lenses, including we can do, uh, we don't use them in our line, but we can, uh, you know, these are all different lenses up here. You buy them with a bucket full. And uh, we can do high curve decenter as well. We can actually measure decenter as well. And we also have a, I, I have a furniture shop and we do some sewing and we also make our own cases for Seo. Wow. Um, most of the cases that we make, we piece work out to people in the, in the area. Um, it, gives, it gives the local, you know, local people some, they do some work at home. They come pick up 50 or 100. They come back and, you know, this is, uh, this is French canvas. Nice. And, yeah, you know, we import it from France, beautiful material. It just gives you a little bit of hand. You know, it costs a lot more than buying a case out of China. The material itself costs me more than a case out of China. But it keeps the money in the, in the, uh, in the, in the area. And it gives you a really nice kind of, you know, finishing touch to- They are, um, beautiful. They are beautiful cases. Um, and you even make your own point of purchase materials, right? I know one of your oh, yes. artists sketched, you sketched Dr. Brill and sketched some of my opticians. It was very cool. Yeah, yeah, that we have uh, one of the uh, women that works here is, is a tremendous artist. She has great caricatures. I hope she got you right, Dr. Brill. Um, so, um, so that's kind of, that's kind of what we do. I mean, there are a little more, you know, there's a little more here and there squirreled away in the corners, but uh, the overall layout of, uh, you know, kind of what we do and how we work, everything, you know, work changes every day, um, depending upon, you know, what, what sort of what part of the uh, process we're in. Cool. Well, um, do you want to head upstairs where we can do some Q&A and talk about your collections that are for sale? Yep, I'll go into the other room. I'm going to shut this, uh, this gimbal off here so we don't get feedback. And then um, I'll be with you in about one minute. Perry, I don't know if you want to go through any questions right now while he's doing that. Yeah, um, we have some Q&A here. I'm going to just get them off here and cancel the spotlight. I know Barry Santini has a few questions. Yeah, so what's our, let's see here. So we did that one already, done. Um, 
So, Brian yeah. Finley. Hey, Brian. Um, Brian's a road warrior, great veteran rep, has owned right. his own school before. Um, I do that too. I feel the pain. Brian wants to know, uh, is Takiron the best Japanese acetate? Okay. Now, there's, you know, when you, when you say Japanese acetate, the only acetate that is truly made in Japan right now is Takiron. There's another company called Dicel. Dicel um, used to make in Japan. They switched over to China. Dicel has a joint venture with Matsukeli in China. It's the same factory that makes Chinese Matsukeli makes Dicel. Dicel is still considered a Japanese acetate um, in that it has that lower plasticizer level. It's harder. Um, also, the Japanese acetates, I mean, we've got I've got you know, a couple of samples here. I've got buckets of these. Um, you know, the Japanese acetates, they tend to do more muted colors. They do the deeper, richer colors really well, um, the more subtle colors. And then, you know, you've got your, your Matsukeli and they do the, the big bright sort of Matsukeli and Lice is the other Italian acetate manufacturer. Um, and they do the, the brighter colors a little bit better. Um, so, it's a difficult question, you know, what is the best? You know, I like Takiron a lot. They're, they're probably the cleanest material. Um, they, uh, they do a really, you know, great job of quality control. They have some good, you know, some good colors. The problem with the Japanese acetates is the people that design the colors are engineers. You know, you meet the Japanese, en the Japanese acetate companies and it's like, oh, here's our engineer and these are our new colors for the year. Whereas, you know, I meet with Lais, you know, once or twice a year and this beautiful woman in, 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 in fashion, you know, um, fashion consultant walks up and she has looked at the colors for the year and what's, what's the Pantone and this and that. And, and so they, they do a much better job with what's in now. Um, but I would agree. I like Takiron a lot. I mean, that's, if, if we have a choice, you know, we use Takiron. Um, okay. We use the Italians only for the more colorful. Um, this comes from uh, Barry Santini, master optician in uh, Long Island. Um, so with beta titanium core temples, mm -hmm. he wants to know that all, does all of his care and adjusting simply undo itself? He said it makes no sense. That's a very good. Well, that's a very good question. Actually, I'm not surprised to get that. You can tell somebody who knows what they're talking about when they ask you a question like that. Um, because if you adjust it the same way as you adjust a regular core temple, you're correct. When you adjust this frame, this is this is a petite that we make. Um, nice small petite frame, super thin, like I said, beta titanium. When you adjust this with a normal material, you would heat it up, bend it, and hold it until it cooled, and there you are. And you're correct. If you let it go there, it will just return back to where it was. When you adjust this, you adjust it just like you adjust a regular beta titanium frame where you heat it up, you bend it, you over bend it, and it takes a little bit to get used to, but you over bend it, you let it, while it's still warm, come back to where it wants to be. And then set it. And so, you know, we do not go through all of the heat treatment that you would go through with a typical beta titanium. It's a little bit softer than a typical beta titanium. You would normally go through some extra heat treatment and, and work treatment to it. Um, to make it a little more adjustable, but if you bend it to where you, you know, if you've been to past where you want it and let it relax back to where it naturally sits, then it does not move. Okay, cool. Um, so we're going to do one more quick question, keep it super brief, and then I do want you to talk about some of your frame lines, and I promise we'll answer every question. Christopher is not going anywhere. <laughs> um, Joe Zui, he owns Inavision. Uh, manufacturer of chemistry clips. Hey, Joe, send us some, uh, a new display, please. We need one. Uh, what type of design software do you use and does it interface with the CNC machine? Does it interface with what? The CNC machine. Okay. Um, you know, there's, honestly, we use one of the, one of the draw, the design for me, she does by hand. She is an artist. I cannot draw for my life, you know. Um, the gentleman that designs for me, he uses uh, Adobe Illustrator. I personally do everything on CAD. I like CAD because it's much more accurate. I use Rhinoceros. 
it's it's easy. What is to it? Use. It's called Rhinoceros. It's a uh, Rhinoceros. Rhinoceros. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a it's a it's a it's a CAD three dimensional three D CAD um, that's actually used um, you know for modeling a lot. And the it, as far as interfacing with the machine, you know, you will have a, a CAD that you do the drawing on. There is no CAD software that interfaces directly with any machine. You then have a CAM uh, software that is what interfaces with your machine. Um, I use a, a, a CAM software that actually plugs directly into the Rhinoceros and you can write your own post processors. So every machine has needs a different language. You can go in with the software I use, you know, typically if you use like MasterCAM, that's a $30,000 piece of software and it costs another you know, five grand to write the lang, you know, to get it to speak the right language to your machine. With the, with the, uh, the CAM that we use, uh, you can actually write your own uh, post processor to interface that with your CAD, with your, with your, with your CNC. Okay, cool. Um, I'm going to launch a poll here. And how do you want to present your eyewear collections? Get on the website or just hold up some frames or talk uh, about it? I'll put it on the website and I'll hold up frames. Okay. So we're doing a poll right now. Um, before we even talk about his collections, you know this guy's the real deal. So um, if you are own an optical or optometry practice, ophthalmology, uh, let us know if you're interested in putting up, putting in an opening order. Wow, you're a salesman, Perry. <laughs> you want to come down to it, you know, even though it's COVID, we're way up at our practice. I don't know if it's the backlog or, or what, but revenue is good. Wish, wish all of our customers were. Um, so um, tell us before, like, everyone gets antsy to go eat, like, pizza, how do you plan to deal with your, your accounts? Are you going to ship them the frames? Are you going to fly over? How are you going to service people and introduce them? Right. Well, typically, I go over to the U.S. twice a year. I spend two months in the road in the spring, two months in the fall um, in the U.S. visiting all of our customers. And I love doing that. I love seeing everybody. I learn a lot about it. Unfortunately, I cannot go to the United States now. Actually, I can go. I can't come back. Um, ah. But so now we are, we are taking care of everybody virtually. And what we do is, you know, we will do a Zoom meeting. We go everything on the website, I, you know, show frames and whatnot. And, you know, I have a promise with all of our customers that if I ship them something and they get it and they're like, the color is a little bit different than I thought it was going to be or something like that, I give them a FedEx number and they ship it back to me. And it's, you know, so there's no risk of buying something. I, I realize that it's better to touch it. I would much prefer to be there as well. Um, unfortunately, you know, the way of the world right now is it's not going to happen, I think, for the next at least six months. Um, maybe in the spring, we shall see. But, okay. uh, you know, we, I don't ask anybody to take any risk um, on, 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 you know, buying something and saying, oh, it's not quite exactly, you know, it doesn't fit the way I thought it would or whatever. Yeah. So what, what Christopher is, if you want to pull up your website and I'm going to talk a little. Um, what Christopher does is if you, if you love this collection, you love this custom manufacturing process, um, he will, you will prepay for the frames on your credit card and he'll ship them to you and you'll have a, uh, what we call a risk reversal. If you don't like them, just send them back, but you will love them and they're beautiful frames. He even makes a frame that fits dog. Oh yeah. Where is that? Uh, we'll, we'll pull it up on your computer. We can see it, but yeah. Oh. Where's Rock? Let me see. Hang on a second. Too many I would say what's more, now you know the backstory, you know the story of the manufacturer, and I think every frame brand, you, you need to know the, the story of it. So uh, now you can say you know Chris personally, and you've seen how they manufactured. It's way different and way more quality, so. And um, something is, you can actually put, um, if the frame does not come with a Asian or African fitting pad, he'll actually put it on for you. Just special request that. Mm -hmm. Yes, we do, uh, we do custom fits as well. Um, I mean, I have an optician that works for me. He's fit 10,000 people. And oh. I'm literate. He was in a busy shop in Tokyo for 15 years. They put on all their nose pads. If you have a customer that's difficult to fit, take a picture with the, where the frame sits naturally and then holding where they want it you know, from front and quarter, send them to us and we'll put it on the appropriate pad. It's a $10 fee or eight to $12 fee, depending okay. on the pad. So um, Christopher, you have 11 people that want, to, that want to talk to you. So we'll make sure you get their information. 
Uh, oh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. More people. One person thinks you're crazy and you should go back to chemical engineering. So uh, sometimes I think the same thing, but that's usually at the end of the month when I'm paying my bills. Um, and quickly plug yourself about you do make custom frame lines. Uh, give us a 20 second spiel about that. Yeah, we do. Um, we do custom work as well. Uh, we do not do, you know, private label where we just have, we have a frame and we, um, we, uh, you know, we'll print your name on it. What we do is we'll design a frame for you and we make anywhere between, you know, we'll make as low as a dozen, but it gets really expensive. Uh, for a typical shop, you'd t be talking about more like, you know, three to five dozen um, per model, multiple colors inside, and up to, we'll do up to 100 frames. I do not do, you know, most, if you go to most manufacturers, they want three, 300 to, five, to 1,000 frames as a minimum order. Um, I don't have the people to do it. Lead times get long. I don't want to deal with it. We are more expensive, but you know, you've got a quarter of the buy-in or less. Um, so we will do custom work. That frame never gets made for anybody else. It's yours. And um, you know, I love doing work like that too. It's a small part of our business, but um, it's a small part of our business, but you know, it is a, it's something I learned a lot from. We have some really fun, great customers. All right, you got the you got it. So pull up your screen now. Okay. Well, you know, here is the dog frame. Oh, the so, dog frame, yeah. Yeah. And we have one of those, don't we, Perry? We do. I think you do. You know, sell more of these than you would think. Um, so, you, you know, your, your bridge fit here. Panto is opposite. It's actually fit to the dog appropriately, and it will even fold. Um, so, uh, let's see. There we go. This is going to be huge. You know, this is our puppy rock. Uh, Aww. Cute. <laughs> so, so, we have... Uh, we have um, we have uh, we we send these all over the world actually. Uh, let's see if we can find them. Am I still sharing my screen here or not? Not yes. right now. Okay. Hey, Ma uh, Dr. Oh, yeah. Megan says you're looking super fly tonight in that suit. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so um, let's see. What I'm not getting the uh, I'm not getting my uh, but for some reason. There you go. Oh, there there you go. You're seeing my? Yes. Okay. You're seeing my, uh, now you can see my email. Yes, we do see yeah. it. <laughs> I don't know why. There we go. Okay. All right. So, uh, so yeah, so this is our, uh, this is our brand SEO here. I think we've got, here's another, here's a friend in Barcelona. She's beautiful. Um, so, uh, yeah, this is our brand SEO. Uh, we've been selling this into the, this, Brand's 10 years old. We've, we keep about uh, about 80 models in the collection, you know, four colors. Um, and uh, four colors, three to six colors, typically. We put out 10 models a season. It's a neoclassic uh, entryway into a funky frame. You've got sort of the Japanese warmth with a little more European coloring to it. Um, and uh, you know, it's, uh, it goes from everywhere from all plastic frames through to, you know, combination frames like you're looking at here. Uh, so I'll just, I, I mean, I'll just pull out some frames here to show to you. It might have been better, might be better on the, uh, so besides dog frames, you know, all acetate, you know, we're, and we'll do facet cuts and, and whatnot. Um, Pictures don't, this bad video doesn't do it justice, everybody, so. You know, some uh, sort of old school, you know, you're looking at a frame here, it's, it's big, a lot of presence, and it's three millimeters thick. And so it's it's a really, you know, it's a heavy frame with a lot of presence. It actually has an Asian bridge on it, so it's going to sit high on me. But heavy frame with a lot of presence, but it's actually super thin and light and comfortable. So, you know, acetate frames like that. Um, and then the beta titanium temples, which we just had the, the discussion on. One other thing about adjusting those beta titanium temples, you would not want to try to widen by bending here. You would widen by taking a little bit of off some sandpaper or something here to, to bring the frame out and then to bring it back in. Um, but again, you know, super comfortable, super flexible, kind of old school, this would be, a, the lighting here is terrible, but sort of old school American 
um, American feel to it. So uh, not sure how, how are you guys, I mean, you know, you're looking at these frames. I, you know, we're not going to go through every, every frame in the collection. Yeah. But, I mean, it's, okay. it's probably very hard to see here. Huh? It's very hard to see. Let's do some okay. Q and A. Um, yeah, but, so, uh, well, okay, go ahead. Um, or just, yeah, share your collection screen here, gallery. Yeah. A, a tape. Yeah. Let me ask you, let me ask a question. So whenever I see a Warby Parker frame come in, mm -hmm. a Zyla one, the front mm -hmm. is totally straight. The temples are straight. Nothing's been adjusted. And mm -hmm. I'm not sure they can adjust them. So is that a property of the Zyla or is that just the cheap manufacturing technique? That's a good question. I mean, you know, it's, it's partly the property of the Zyla. Um, uh, you know, certain, you know, very cheap Zyl um, is very soft. And depending upon how you process, if you process at really high speeds, it tends to, you know, when you, when you bend it, you know, you'll get some internal stress. And then it does exactly what Barry was saying. It goes back to where it was. And so, it, you know, it wants to go back to a flat frame. Part of it is the way they cut their lenses and the type of lenses that they use. Um, and so, and they probably didn't bother adjusting when they went to, when they gave them to the patient because, you know, the, how much time can you spend on somebody for? Right. Um, so it is, it is, a, it is a, I think it's a, a combination of all of them, honestly. Okay. What's, I want to do some more questions. Let's try to keep them rapid fire because we have 15 to go through. Uh, okay. What's your average frame price? Okay. Um, We'll, 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 you know, for now, just being online, I, I'm happy to get into details of. Uh, I thought you were going to do that, Barry. Work. Yeah. But um, what uh, our average frame, uh, you know, retail prices. Yeah. The Sayo collection is from 375 to 475, and for the, uh, we do have a couple that get a little more expensive. I'll show you those here, um, and then for the uh, ethnicity collection is 300 to 400. Okay. All right. So pretty. Pretty average, nothing out of the ordinary. Um, well, Japanese frames, I would I would say average to the ethnicity line being low. Yeah. Um, Tom Tio, do you, do you use Japanese hinges? Of course, Tom. How you doing, Tom? Hope you're well. Um, yes, we do. I have all of our hinges are specially made for us. Um, you know the way they make a hinge. And I don't have one here to show you, but if you if you looked at the hinge, um, you can't see me so. The way they make a hinge is if you look at the profile of a hinge, they make a profiled wire. That is a long extruded wire that is the shape of the, the, the hinge that's you know a couple of meters long. And then they chop them up into little pieces and they go through and they tap them and everything else. Um, we design them to put pins where we want to put the pins, to have the, you know the, how big the foot is, how big the hinge plate is, and we have them all specially made for us. I have made hinges myself, quite honestly, at our scale, it just doesn't make sense. You have to buy, you know. 100, 200 kilograms of profile wire. And, you know, we just don't make that many frames. How does that differ from a German hinge? German hinges, actually, you know, it's funny. Everybody says German hinges. Um, hinges are not, in Germany right now, they do not make, you know, even OBE, which is the biggest uh, German hinge maker. Um, the front hinges are all made in China. And they only make the spring part of the hinge on the temple in Germany now. In Italy, there is only one true Italian spring hinge maker. It's the only spring hinge we actually use on a few of our frames. Uh, it's called Ideal. Um, and, um, you know, the, the, the basic process is the same. Japanese do not make spring hinges. They don't like spring hinges. I think part of it is people have very wide heads. They tend to wear them sprung all of the time. And eventually you have reliability issues um, because you're always wearing them, you know, sprung out off the side of the head. Um, so, you know, German, you know, it's not to say there's anything wrong with the German hinges. They, they do an excellent job of quality control. But the Japanese, you know, when the, the Japanese hinges, um, the hinge maker that we use actually does work for the medical industry as well. They make artificial hips, which I have two of. Um, I like titanium so much. I, heck, <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, they do all sorts of super, super high, you know, uh, very detailed work. Okay. I want to get, I'm going to, a few people actually want to talk to you. So I'm going to see if they're live and can ask a question. Uh, first one is uh, Bob Fessmeyer. Um, 
If you want to ask Christopher a question live, uh, jump in here, else we'll move on. All right, we're going to move on. Um, got another person. Uh, Ansel Johnson, if you would like to ask a question, you're live. Un you need to unmute yourself, though. Hey, Chris. How are you? Hey, Chris. How are you? Hey, Chris. How are you? How are you doing, sir? I believe we were, we have been in contact. We're getting it. We're getting it. We're getting it. We're getting it. Um, let's see here. Try one more. Th All right. Don't know what's going on there. Is that better? 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 Put it in the chat. Sorry. Okay, um, next here, um, someone wants to know what St Stefano Perlus, what chemical is used to attach the nose pads to the front? Okay, you can use over there, in the, if you're in the United States, you can use acetone. Um, that's what most people in the United States use. We use, it's, a, it's a, um, acetylamide. It's, uh, they sell it over here. I don't know that it's sold in the US. You might have to buy it by the drum. Uh, it's a little easier to work with, but acetone will work just fine. Okay. Uh, Ansel, are you, you want to try again? Yes. 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 Needs to turn his um, computer speakers down. I can try that. It's a, spe it's a pleasure to speak to you again, Dr. Johnson. By the way. Then I can't hear you. Is that better? That's better. Okay. Um, sunglass collection. Do you have carry sunglass or all of yours of Bauman? Everything we do is, is available both in a sun and an ophthalmic. Um, some of our glasses, you know, sort of lean more towards the sun, but we do not have a specific sun line. Um, but we will put sun lenses in anything. In your demo lenses? Yes. Yeah, so, um, hang on a second here. You know, here we have. We sell this as both an ophthalmic and a sun, and it would come with demo lenses. And then for a small adder, you know, we would put sun lenses in it for you. We use uh, Japanese, we, we tend to use CR39 for the most part, AR coat, Japanese made, very, very nice lenses. Okay, awesome. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. All right, um, let's get more questions here. Uh, Barry, again, wants to know, please spell out the Japanese acetate company name. Takiro, T-A-K-I-R-O-N. I think he wants it spelled out in Japanese characters. <laughs> <laughs> that would be Takiro. <laughs> it's actually written typically in the... Um, it's a company called Takiron Roland. They make everything from acetate to drain pipes. Uh, big plastic manufacturer here in Japan. Okay. Um, I, can, I can send, if, if he wants a link or something like that, I'm happy to send it afterwards. Okay. Uh, Mice Bossum wants to know, do you collaborate with private brands? Are you in Fukai or Tokyo? Uh, we are in Niigata. We are... Um, about a four hour drive, a two hour bullet train ride from Tokyo. We're actually co closer than Fukui. It's easier to get to us. Uh, so you can do a day trip from Tokyo, um, come out, there's a bullet train runs right here. It's exactly two hours and we're about 20 minutes away. Um, and yes, we do work for brands. Um, typically, you know, we'll do, we were talking about the, the um, OEM work that we do. We will do anywhere from, like I said, a dozen to a hundred frames per model. Our prices go down as volumes go up. At 100 frames, my price doesn't go down anymore because I don't have the people in the bandwidth to support it. Um, but a lot of brands use us for getting started. You know, uh, what kills brands and what killed, what was killing me, which is why I got into doing this, is you go and sink all your money into your first collection. You go see your customers, you go see customers, everyone says, oh, that's really nice. Come back and see me in the spring. You go back in the spring. They say, oh, that's really nice. Come back and see me in the fall. You need something new every season to bring them but you don't start selling the volume to get through these, you know, the first minimum orders for three, four seasons. By your third season, you're straining yourself up because you don't have any cash left over. It's all sitting on your shelf. And so a lot of brands, what they'll do is they'll start with us, you know, they'll make 100, 
100 frames, you don't make the margins, but you can do two or three models instead of one. And that just allows you to sort of get going. And then I am happy to introduce other manufacturers that'll do the volume for you. I, I, you know, we do what we do and there's nobody that competes with us because there's nobody else that does that kind of volume, uh, those volumes. And then when, if you ever get bigger then, and you need somebody with, that does more volume for you, I'm, I'm happy to work with you to help you know, introduce you and, and I, we give out your, the drawings are yours um, and the designs are yours, so. Wow, that's nice. Um, all right. Um, Bob Festmeyer of Opticians on Facebook, good moderator there, wants to know, so what makes the actual process different in Japan versus China or Europe? Nothing special machine-wise is there. You're absolutely right. In actuality, and this, this goes for all industries, the equipment set in China is typically better than in Japan. I mean, I used to work in the electronics industries. I would go in and out of, you know, circuit board shops uh, all the time. And all brake controllers are made in Japan because it's a very important piece of equipment. You look at the equipment, it looks, I mean, it looks like an old hag. I mean, it's, they're all like what you were looking at here. They're old, you know, they're, they're kind of pieced together. It's the way you run the equipment. It's your people. The people, is the difference. It's the attention to detail. It's the care that goes into it. Um, and that's something that I feel very strongly about too, is, you know, you, you go into, and, and you're, and you know, if you look at piecework, you're ordering somebody, something, you know, wherever, if it's Japan or China, you, you order it to a company, they piecework it out to somebody else. There's some craftsman that's four or five, you know, um, steps back that says, make a hundred of these. And they just go through, they, they don't know what the final product is going to look like. They don't really care it, because it's, they, they just make their hundred little pieces and send it out and then and they're done with it. Whereas, you know, what I've been trying to do is get our craftspeople closer to the end user, closer to our customers. And so the people that you see here, you know, when, when, when we get, a, you know, thanks on a Facebook post or whatever, you know, my people see that. They, they actually see where their product, what they're doing goes. And it just, it, it's, it's, you know, it, it engages them. And I, I, I really believe the equipment set in China is far and away better. Um, it's the way you run your equipment. It's the way to maintain your equipment. It's the little tiny things that you do. You know, I used to work with a circuit board shop that once a month, he would, the plant manager would run the most difficult part, whether they had to do it or not, just to keep people on their toes. You know, just to keep people, you know, interested and in, 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 uh, in focused on what they're doing. And so it's really more about the people than the equipment. The equipment, you can buy equipment. You can't buy people. Yeah. Um, while we're kind of finishing up some questions here, um, Chris, would you mind just verbalizing your phone number to me, your American phone number people can call you on? Sure. It's 352-282-3500. Uh, and that rings to me here in Japan. It accepts texts as well. And I'm usually up and the phone is on after 3.30 in the afternoon Eastern Standard Time. Um, if not, you can leave me a message and I will get back to you. All right, I'm gonna put Chris's um, email and phone number. I'll share with everybody here while we answer a few more questions. Please reach out to him. Is that correct? Did I get that right there? Yes, that is correct. Okay. All right, um, Kevin Count wants to know, do you use the chips to press into new sheets? Um, I have done it and no, <laughs> honestly. I mean, you can, you know, um, the problem is stability, uniformity. I mean, how do you control the amount of plasticizer in there? Uh, I just, you know, I've tried to do it. It's very unstable and it can get very messy. And honestly, I just, we don't, you know, to, to do that at any sort of volume, you need some specialized equipment as well. And so we do not, we do not do that. Okay. All right. And stop the share. All right. Let's see what else here. What about children's frames? Uh, we he just wants to know about that. 
yeah, we did not do children's frames. Um, I would love to do children's frames. A child's frame costs as much as an adult's frame, and everybody thinks it should be cheaper. Yeah. And, you know, it's just not, we haven't gotten into that. How about petite frames? Petite about frames petite. we do do. You know, we, we just put out a couple of petite frames. Um, you know, this frame here, two sizes, you know, soup, you know, two sizes, two um, multiple colors. We have other ones as well that are, you know, super small. I mean, this frame on me, I have a relatively small head. And, you know, this frame on me, you, you can see. Yeah. So, and, and how about big, how about big, big boy, how about big boy <laughs> frames? How about the guys with the 72 PDs? And yeah. I had a gentleman, I had a gentleman today like that. And he, and he had a, has had as big as mine. So, uh, they fill up the whole slit lamp. I mean, <laughs> they can't wear a hat because it looks like a toy on them. Right. And when you put your biggest uh, XXL frame on, they're like, uh, I thought you had big frames. So, right. or we, we can order those. We, we can order a bigger frame. Um, we do have a couple. And also, okay. you know, with our ethnicity line, which we haven't start, started talking about, um, and, and this is something we do with the Asian line as well. Koreans have pretty, pretty big heads too, don't they? They're more yes. uh, bowling ball size. A lot of times they're wider than they are long. Mm -hmm. So, so it's, this is the difference between an Asian fit frame and like what we sell for the African um, African fit. And and I, I'd like to talk to talk about ethnicity a little bit. Okay. A second. Um, here we go. So this is from the African one, and. Can you, if you can see here, can you hold it closer to your webcam? There you yeah. go. Can you see the cranks in the temple there? Yeah. Okay. So basically, you can keep your front size, and this is not going to sit right on me. Um, you can keep your front size a little smaller. You've still got a good PD here. And yet, you've got a lot of width in here. Okay. And so do you have some for uh, the high myopes, but with a long end piece? So you can have a smaller lens for those high myopes, but, but something that fits their head. We do, we're always looking for something like that with a longer end piece, but a, a small round lens in there. Like something like this? Yes, something like that. Yeah, so you've got nice small lens. We just put out a beautiful woman's frame. Here we go. Um, and this is something that anybody that cuts lenses will get it too, for exactly what you were talking about. Got the head width, got a nice small lens, it's cut off out here. So you're losing the extra thickness of the lens back out right. here at the, at the outside. You know, it's a, it's a beautiful, petite, small lens frame. Bring it a little closer to your camera. Yes, there you go. That's nice. And pretty unidimensional, not totally round, but something that will will look good it and you put that minus nicely. 10 or minus 12 in there without a problem right and you don't get the thickness out here at the edge right so nicely you've got a little three dimension in the bridge okay good extra interest um and so yeah that's that's one of the things that's great about one of my people being an optician as an optician here you're a refracting optician that cut all your own lenses so you do everything and so, you know, we think about when we do a frame, um, for example, like this, where you have a groove mount, we've got beta titanium at the bottom, and then, you know, plastic at the, the top, you do a groove mount, you know, we'll chamfer out in the back, in the corner. Okay. So you get your groove in there, you don't have oh. to fool around with grinding on the lens. And you so could fold the temple like down. That. Yeah, and then you could fold the temple down. Exactly. So okay. little little things that you know people that that you know you just uh, that you know little, little things that most people when they make frames they don't get into. Um, but to get back to the uh, the wider you know like an Asian fit. You know this here is an Asian fit frame. It's got the built up bridge, a little bit tighter. But if you look at the shape of the the, the temples, bring it closer. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. It's barreled out. It's, yep. a point, it's a 0.8 beta titanium, so it's really flexible. And then piece of advice for anybody who sells Asian fit frames. When you, fit your, when you put your frames out on the floor, take your temples and bend them in. 
doing this without heat here, but bend them in hard, cranked in this way, okay? A little harder than you would want, normally want to wear. So when somebody puts it on, it's going to grab really tight back here, okay? It's going to keep it from sliding down their face the first time they put it on. Okay. And you can adjust it later. If somebody puts it on, this is what all my Japanese customers do. If somebody puts a frame on and slides down their face, they're not going to buy it. That's very smart. Yeah, I like that. So yeah. you, so you I'll have to... You fit I'll to adjust to all our, our earth in the sea and say our frames tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> but, hey, you know, uh, so you've got the rounded, you've got the, for the more rounded Asian head here. Okay. And people, you know, they come in a little bit tighter back here too. Yeah. You know, it just tends to, to drop off a little bit more. Whereas with your African, fr African frame, we keep the width. But if you look at the length, the difference in the length of the temples. Wow. Wow. You know, this is a 152 yeah. millimeter temple that you can actually yeah. pull off the temple tip and cut off, ten, cut off a half an inch and then you can put it back on. Yes. Better to be too long and cut it off and make it shorter than to have it to be too short and have nothing you can do with it. Now, what do you do for the patients that have low ears? Low ears. Low you see ears. people on TV, and they're, they're, their temples are straight back, touching the top of their ears. And yeah. I'm thinking, I'm taking photos of people on TV and I'm thinking like, that person's got the wrong frame on, but... Um, yeah. That's, you know, the, the hardest part is your panto there. You know what I mean? I mean, most frames and your panto is going to change depending upon yeah. you know, the angle of your hinge and how high that hinge is up on the frame. Right. If that makes sense, right? I mean, if, you're, if your hinge is way up high on the frame and they have low ears, you know, essentially the frame is sitting retrospective, um, scoffing yeah. to the face. You don't have like a Sophia Loren uh, low temple or old Dita low temple frame for it that would look decent on people with low ears? Well, we do have frames that, you know, we will put, you know, we keep the temples down a little bit lower. Okay. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, basically, I mean, that's, you, you're really, you know, with a frame like this, um, we have, I don't know if you can see this here, but it was like a little notch. Oh, yes. You see that little notch? If you get on both sides of that with a pair of pliers and you twist, you actually get a lot of panto because okay. you're adjusting it way up front of the frame. So a small amount of twist here will give you a right. really, really big That's difference good. in the panto. So our, our metals are, are made so that you can adjust, do That's a significant good. adjustment to the panto without having to adjust the hinge. Right, um, yeah, we don't want to lose that hinge in there. Too many, people, also, uh, too many people adjust frames without any tools. And next yep. thing you know, that hinge is coming out of there. Exactly. We also do another type of way to do adjust panto here. Can you see the end of this uh, temple? See yes. how round? Right? And it fits into the round. Uh, I see. Yes. Okay. So when you adjust by bending the barrel of the hinge, you always get, you know, you don't get a gap. That, that barrel adjusts. Like I see. Got much. it. Um, so, you know, there we, do, we try to make the frames as adjustable as possible. For okay. those people. But, you know, the people with really low ears, you, like you said, you try to pick a frame with the drop tempo. Okay. Perry, do you got any more questions? Because we, you know, we're probably getting into, you know, we're I, going on two hours here and I, I haven't eaten any dinner and now Chris is ready to eat breakfast. So I'm, 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 we're not even at lunch yet. So I'm good. Yeah. My dog is, wants to go to the bathroom. Um, <laughs> anyways. Wait, wait. One minute to talk about ethnicity a little bit. And the, yeah, the go ahead. Timing. Just yeah. just one quick minute. Sure. Um, yeah, let's, let's, you know, let's try to finish up in the next five minutes or so. Yeah. Um, ethnicity, you know, came out as, I mean, I travel all over the U.S. Everybody wants Asian fit frames. Our SEO collection, you know, we do both Asian and Western fit on that. And I was thinking about doing a, an Asian one that was more specifically designed like we just showed you. Right. And I was at a customer in, in um, it was uh, Philadelphia. And I walked in and the big black guy is, a, is the optician. And he said, what do you have for me? And you were talking about big frames? <laughs> I said, nothing. I, mean, I had all <laughs> frames with me, you know, and I had nothing for him. And, and, you know, living here in Japan, I mean, I am, I know three foreigners in the prefecture that I live in. You know, I can go months without seeing another Westerner. I go to a store, nothing fits. And to, but, to be, but to be here and have that happen, that's fine. In the United States, why is it that we are so, you know, um, European-centric in right. our design 
when the majority, when half of our population, that's not what, you know, that's not what the population is. And so people are kind of squeezing themselves to fit yeah. the mold and, you know, a color, coloring on frames. I mean, when we do, you know, when we look at coloring for the ethnicity Africa line, you know, we use foundations from a beautiful caramel to a, to a, I see, nice. you know, and, and to see how the colors work because the colors that look good on me are not going to look good on a, on a, on an African, somebody from African descent and it's not going to look for somebody good on somebody from Southeast Asia. And so, I mean, coloring is different and it's, it, the, the differences are so minor, but they're important. Yeah. And so, you know, to me, walking around the U S selling frames, I'm saying to myself, you know, this is just, it's, to me, it's inclusivity, you know, it's being serviced. And, and so that's kind of where we came at it. Um, and, you know, with the African collection, I know I don't know what the African pop, you know, population in the United States want. And that's why we have a couple of uh, stylists in the U.S., Dr. Ramsey um, and Anissa. Um, I was saying Dr. Ramsey would be happy to hear all this, but um, so because <laughs> yeah, we've, um, we've had him on our pod, podcast, and I think Perry's been on his, so... Uh, yeah, and 13% thir of the American population don't have frames that fit well. Right, exactly. And that's, you know, that's, and, and I was talking to Adam and he's like, man, you just don't know. And I was like, yeah, you're right. I don't. And so that's how we started working together. And he's styling, you know, he and uh, Nissa are styling the frames. They kind of give us a direction, sizes, colors and whatnot. And then, um, and then, you know, we manufacture and, and, and we sell. And so, you know, we, we work together with this. So to me, you know, that's kind of what the ethnicity line is. It's, it's, inclus it's inclusion. We're going to continue to, to, to expand out and do different ethnicities. There are, you know, like the Asian, we're talking about head shape, but also people have very high prescriptions. You know, the African um, population tend to have, you know, actually oilier skin, which means that frames tend to slide down a little bit differently. You need different angles on the nose bridges. They're very subtle differences, but that's the difference between you know, a frame that fits and looks really good and one that does not. So, anyway, that, that was just wanted to, uh, and I'm happy to talk about that more, but I think everybody's been on here for a long time and, uh, you know, we can get to that if uh, anybody has any interest, I'm happy to talk to them directly. What does a minimum order look like to you? Just so people uh, know, you know, is it a hundred pieces? Or is it three pieces? I've had hundred piece orders, not many. <laughs> um, Honestly, you know, it, with the sale line, I mean, it's a pretty deep line. We ask there's a presence in, your, in, in the practice in the store. Um, and that's different for every store. I mean, someplace, you know, you guys have a lot of frames. Man. You know, to put three frames in the corner, you'd never find us. Um, I'd say with Sayo, we average it, you know, thir three dozen, but I've done as low as 15. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to work with people. I'd rather have a smaller opening order and then, you know, build and have a long relationship than stuff you know, 70 frames down somebody's throat and go back six months later and have them say, no, I still got a lot. So um, we're pretty flexible on that. You know, I would, I would say if you think about uh, for the Sayo collection, a couple of dozen to a couple of few dozen um, would be a, a great place to start. Ethnicity, you know, we don't have as many models yet um, and it can be much more compact um, and depends, you know, what, what you need, where you live, where you are and what your, your uh, demographics are. That's good. I'm sure everybody appreciates that flexibility that you have because we don't like to have somebody says we need a 48 piece open order uh, and then you never see anybody again. And, right. uh, you know, and that's, that's just bad. That's just bad. I don't, so. run a business. I don't like anybody telling me what to do. That's why I run my own business. Although you find yeah. that you have customers that do, but that's why I run a business. I don't want somebody coming in and telling me what to do. You know, if my tool supplier comes in and says, oh, no, you got to buy 10 pieces of that on three. I'm like, hey, go away. I'll find somebody else. You know, I, yeah, we don't I'd want, we don't want quotas. Uh, as, as Cartier has changed, you know, they had quotas. And uh, who likes that? You know what I mean? Right. Just don't want to have that. Right. No, no, we don't have quotas or anything like that. We're, we're very flexible. Great. Do you want to put that poll up? Maybe a few more people want to sign up. I mean, I yeah, I think you have that up very shortly. I'll put it up one more time. Um, so again, if you want to purchase, if you want to talk, chat, shoot the, shoot the breeze, uh, you can like talk. I talked to Christopher on uh, uh, Facebook Messenger. There's my dog. Um, <laughs> so any way you want to get in touch with him, he's easy going. What I learned is I don't need a sales rep always. 
as long as I know, like, you answer the phone, respond to my email. That's, that's all I need. Uh, if you have one, great. So um, there is one person out there, they want to know, do you have sales agents? Are you looking for sales agents? Um, you know, I was, I've been back and forth on that. I have had uh, some sales reps in the past. It's a, it's a tough job. I know, I mean, I know what it's like. I'm on the road, you know, four months a year in the United States. I know what it's like. And um, honestly, I have been leaning towards hiring somebody here and having them tr service the U.S. from here. I think with the ethnicity line, it's a much broader line. And so I would be interested. But for the SAO line, I think right now, it's, it's a little more boutique-y and it's not going to be quite as broad. Um, I'm planning on servicing that from here. But I am open to all. I do have a company in the United States that handles our payments. It's my company. It's an LLC in the U.S. Just handles payments. No, there's no overseas wiring and whatnot. But I do not have physical presence in the United States. So um, I would be open to considering a 1099 rep. Um, but you know, right now I'm not actively searching. Okay. And do you, do you sell it. worldwide? Will you sell on any uh, continent? I'm sorry? You sell worldwide outside of the United States. Will you sell to someone in Africa? Uh, in, oh, sure. in Australia. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, we have custom, some customers in Europe, not as many, uh, not nearly as many, um, because I don't spend much time. With them. But, um, yeah, absolutely. You know, we, uh, our, our products, you know, we, we keep traceability in all our, our materials. So there's CE, um, there's no issues there. We are FDA registered to ship to the United States. There are no issues there. Okay. Do you need any special tools for your frames? No, no special tools at all. I mean, we, you know, you see your standard pliers and screwdrivers and this and that and other thing. That's, that's it. Okay. okay. Um, we're going to conclude this. This is our first two hour live stream. We generally do about an hour. So congratulations, Christopher. Uh, we've kept 40 people on out of, uh, I think the 65, 70 we had on originally. Um, this was our most popular one in a while. We actually had about 200 registrations in case anybody's wondering. So uh, we'll do more of this uh, fun stuff. Maybe we'll have a round two. Maybe we'll do a master optician workshop or something. So I, th I think this is interesting because I always uh, think that a lot of the professions are siloed. Okay, as an optometrist, uh, I have no idea what happens in, into a lab except our own lab. But, and I have been to another uh, manufacturer going through their frame, frame manufacturing process. But a lot of times we have no idea what's going on in a whole other aspect, important aspect of the profession. And, and probably you don't know what we do in the exam room or dry eye workups and all that. So I think it's always nice when we could really collaborate and get appreciation for all that's involved in it. And I think that should help in the sales process because, you know, for that person that flings that frame, you know, here's the, I don't want this one, you know what, and, and grabs a Three thousand dollars worth of frames in one fist. I'm like, oh, please don't do that. <laughs> you know, there was a lot of effort to get that frame to be nice and polished. Um, so, so if we can impart that to the consumers, that's that's all all the better, and we can have an appreciation for what else everybody does. So, in any case, and uh, one more thing, uh, uh, and what your website is. I'm sorry. What's your website? Our websites are. Uh, www.sayo.com that is S-A-Y hyphen O-H dot com and ethnicity eyewear.com You don't sell direct to consumers, do you? No, we do not. Okay, so you don't have, you're not opt-in on Amazon, you're not trying to compete with us. Okay, that's good. No. no. Um, eventually... Do you have a referral? Let me ask you this. Do you have a uh, uh, a a network of like a, I would say a dealer network for lack of a better um, term. Well, you know, we um, are re work re revamping our website. Eventually all of our dealers are going to be up there. And it's gonna okay. Be I think that is smart. Somebody mm -hmm. might see a frame somewhere and say, wow, or they see someone on an airplane and say, where'd you get that frame? And uh, it's actually sometimes it's, you know, they say, did you get that at Brills? So that's kind of fun. But, <laughs> but you know, sometimes you see some, but I've asked people, people ask me, like, where'd you get those shoes? And right on the, uh, right on the walkway, the guy's ordering the shoes from Alan Edmonds or something, you know? Right. But I think that 
they should know that there are places they can get it and uh, and that would help uh, i think any of your d dealers would be happy to you know be on that list oh, absolutely you're absolutely right and it's just it's unfortunately it's been a bandwidth problem with, with me and in, in our websites but um, we also when we get requests from you know questions from customers emails and whatnot we refer them to our customers in the that's area. good that's yeah, very we good don't, we don't sell direct that's not part of my that's experience. good we appreciate that uh, with that being said, um, we'll conclude. If you're listening to this, I hope you join our Facebook group. Um, email me, text me, text Christopher, ask Dr. Brill questions. Um, this has been fun. That's been great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And again, everybody, Tuesday, Dr. Peter Fahm, uh, we're talking about okra-based products for dry eye. and um, Not Oprah, but okra. Okra, yeah. <laughs> Uh, maybe we'll share some like uh, air fried okra recipes. <laughs> Keep it healthy. So. All right, everybody, take care. Thanks. Have a nice it was, evening. It was a pleasure. Thank you all so much. Please feel free to reach out anytime. Okay, right. Chris. Thank you. Have a great day.